We've previously looked at the molecular orbitals for H2+, the simplest possible molecule, which only has one electron. So now we're going to move on to the Hamiltonian and molecular orbitals for diatomic molecules in general and uh, look at what types of uh, wave functions we get there. So the Hamiltonian I have written up top here is a general Hamiltonian for any diatomic molecule. You've got a nucleus A with uh, ZA number of protons, integer number of protons, and atomic units there for the charge, and ZB for the number of protons in nucleus B, diatomic having two nuclei, of course. And then I have uh, two electrons drawn here. Let's call them electrons one and two. Uh, this works in general for up to N electrons uh, labeled with these numeric indices. And in general, in quantum chemistry, nuclei are labeled with these type of alphabetic indices here. So the type of interactions we get are the same types of interactions we got in atoms where we had attractions of all of these charged particles to each other, electrons to nuclei and uh, electrons repelling each other as well. But the thing that is new now is the nuclei repelling each other. So previously, uh, we've seen in Hartree-Fock and in other things, once we invoke uh, the Born-Oppenheimer approximation and the basis set approximation, that we're going to use these 1s orbitals from, this, from the individual hydrogen atoms as our guess for our starting wave function coefficients, that this type of approximation here, our electron kinetic energy and our attraction of the electrons to nucleus A and nucleus B, these sum indicating that it's for all electrons. We know we can solve this part exactly if we have some explicit form for what these uh, electron wave functions are, what these molecular orbitals are. And then the difficulty comes in, the bane of our existence in quantum chemistry is always the repulsion of electrons from one another because we can't solve that exactly. We can't separate these I and J indices, these two indices of electrons. So we can't do separation of variables and, and resulting uh, in one electron functions at a time. So this part can't be solved exactly. And that's why we need to do approximations like Hartree-Fock. And then taking into account the Born-Oppenheimer approximation that our, electron, our nuclei are much, much heavier than our electrons, so our nuclei are stationary relative to our electrons. They don't move, so we're solving for the wave functions just of the electrons. So with the nuclei fixed at one point, their kinetic energy is going to be zero for nucleus B and also for nucleus A. And thus they're going to be fixed at some point, so this 1 over RAB is going to be a simple algebraic quantity. That's just 1 over a distance. So this, all these three nuclear-only terms here become very simple algebra to compute those energies for a given configuration of nuclei. Okay, so we're going to have our basis set here is going to be the 1s orbital on nucleus A and nucleus B. These are going to combine together and we saw previously for H2 plus that these combine uh, positively and negatively to produce two different orbitals. So we have their positive combination where we go up to a peak, go down some, then up to a peak again and decay away. That was our that was our positive combination and that gives us the sigma g molecular orbital. Then we had the anti-symmetric combination where we had the difference of these two, where it reaches zero in the bottom and there's a node in the middle. And then going back up there, and that gives us the sigma u orbital. So if we put our two nuclei here and we could do a projection for some isosurface of what this looks like when we're looking at it side on, our sigma g orbital is going to have the same sign everywhere. It's always going to be positive. So we'll get something which has a surface that looks like something like this. It's always going to be positive everywhere we look. And then for our sigma u, we got something that's positive over here and negative over here. And then there's a node in the middle, a point where there's no electron density in the middle. And that's our sigma u molecular orbital. Okay, so we've got these two molecular orbitals there, those two spatial orbitals. We've got the sigma g and the sigma u. And that gives us four spin orbitals because we can put a spin up and a spin down electron in each of these uh, molecular orbitals here. 
And for hydrogen, we've got one electron from hydrogen A, one electron from hydrogen B if we're going to be forming neutral H2. So what we can do is approximate our wave function as a determinant which has two electrons, one spin up and one spin down in the sigma g orbital. So our sigma g is the filled bonding orbital in this case. Now there would also be determ other determinants as well. There would be spin up, spin down, spin up, spin up, spin down, spin up, spin down, spin down, and then both uh, in sigma u. And in order to get the exact solution, you actually need to include the effect of all of these individual determinants in your in your uh, calculation. This would be what we called full CI, full configuration interaction. If we were to include all these determinants, this was what we discussed in post hartree fock methods. But in general, what we do is we just assume that our wave function is only one determinant. We assume that one determinant dominates the entire uh, wave function there. And we can get that just through hartree fock theory. So generally, the types of orbitals we're going to present here are either going to be um, some type of qualitative intuition-based thing based off of the atomic orbitals uh, that we think about for uh, hydrogen through neon. We're going to go up through the end of the second row of the periodic table. And we're just going to assume that there's some hartree fock solution, which is just one determinant, one occupation there. Okay, so we've got... For our ground state, we've got our HA, our hydrogen with nucleus A here. That brings in its 1s orbital, which is this orbital right here. And we've got HB on the left, brings in its 1s orbital as well. And HS brings an electron with it. HB brings an electron with it. And together, these individual 1s orbitals mix to give us what we said was our sigma g lower energy bonding orbital and our sigma u high energy antibonding orbital. The sigma u is higher in energy than a reference state which is two hydrogen atoms split apart. So it's unfavorable to put electrons in the sigma u orbital. But the sigma g orbital has with two electrons in it is lower in energy than two hydrogen atoms split infinitely apart. So it's favorable for the atoms to come together, form this bond and get into this lower energy state. So this type of molecular orbital diagram is the thing that we're going to do for uh, going forward with the second row now as well with uh, lithium through neon, building these types of molecular orbitals from the basis set of atomic orbitals and then seeing what type of diagrams we can get as a result for that. So as far as our ground state for H2 of H2, we would say that that is sigma g2. Just like you would say a helium atom is 1s2, we have our molecular orbital sigma g is sigma g2. There's a spin up and a spin down electron in sigma g. Then additionally there's the possibility that we're going to have higher uh, orbitals beyond this once we include the second row that are also going to be sigma g or sigma u. Uh, pi u and pi g. And in the case where we would have another sigma g orbital, we would rank them then by their energies. And we would call this one sigma g because it's the lowest energy sigma g orbital. And this being one sigma u because it's the lowest energy sigma u. So we could also say that this ground state of H2 is one sigma g2. So now we're going to see how we do this for a uh, second row where we've got the 2s and 2p orbitals coming into play as well and what kind of orbitals we get from that.